welcome to the Athlete Story Podcast. Oh, I'm so honored to be here. Thank you so much. I know the time zone is different, but it's great to be on with an Olympian. Yeah, likewise, likewise. <laughs> well, I wanted to have you on as an amazing athlete, um, mm. but also as a like a real champion when it comes to sharing your story and, and giving that inspiration when it comes to sharing the lessons that you've learned. You know, we, we can make transitions really fast and quick, depending upon what's been in our life. And then later on, you go back and, you know, when people ask me, well, how did you get over it? How did you handle that, that painful part of your life? And so as I've gone back and re-looked at the entire process, you know, I had high goals and high dreams of serving in our, our military and going on to officer candidate school. And, and I had a whole career path that was laid out before me. I had all my transition was ready for when I'd made the transition after track and field to, to keep continuing the military career. And then after that was to work for the military uh, in a civilian capacity for another 20 years and do like almost a double retirement. So my whole pathway was, was, um, was thought about and, and thought in the forefront. And when you look at the accolades that came behind what uh, before that day, you know, having run for the University of Arkansas, being a four time uh, all American in, in the hurdles and, and uh, the mile relay teams, uh, I, I really was on this fast track and it's seen and modeled other people who were on my team that were already Olympians. So I knew that I, could, I knew what it took to make the team and I was willing to do the work and the sacrificing to make it and put build a support network around me. But on that day, when everything turned upside down and the leg is, I'm looking at my leg and I know, you know, I have to make a tough choice probably in the near future. On that day, I, I began going internal and a lot of my fears started coming out. And I think we all have these fears. Now, the fears are in three parts, I believe. The first is the fear of myself. So I am turning inward and to myself and saying, um, who's going to support me now? Will my wife still see me as her husband? Will she stay with me? Will my son, who's five and a half years old, will he still value me and see me as his dad? Mm -hmm. Do I still have a job? Can I support my family in the United States Army? Can I, uh, all these things were in my head. Cause you know, my Olympic dreams are over. I, I don't know if I can support my family. All those things were moving very quickly in my mind. And I began to go down this downward spiral of despair. Uh, and when the doctor said, you know, you have a choice to make, you know, how do you make a choice like that? Um, where you are choosing to, to create something that is so permanent that there's no going back uh, yeah. from the amputated leg. You're not growing that leg back. And I think that's where we are in, in our lives. You know, when we, we as athletes are making a move and are transitioning you know, that part, part of our life is done. It, it's, it's gone now. And so what is our new identity that we have in this, what I call the new normal? I think the second fear I had was fear of other people. How are other people going to view me yeah. or keep me in their box? Other people choosing to believe for me what I can or cannot do, yeah. which is based on what they believe they could or could not do if they were in my situation. So that's the second fear. And um, how are my teammates going to look at me now? Uh, can I uh, not, can I be strong enough to be separated from them? Or am I going to be pulled back into that world? And I'll just do one more Olympic games. I'll, you know, I'll do one more uh, uh, FIFA match. I'm going to do one more. And we keep doing the one more because we're so afraid to make the transition on what the other side actually looks like. And then society has, we have fears of society. What have we listened to? What have, what, have, what have we allowed into our mind and our brain to make us think that something is going to uh, hold us back to our initial fears? Why do we believe those fears in the first place? You know, for me, you know, everybody's seen Walt Disney movie. They've seen Captain Hook. Captain Hook's an amputee in the Walt Disney movie, Peter Pan. Uh, and he's an amputee and he's a villain of the movie. So now do I associate myself as a villain, as a dark, as a scary character? because I see Captain Hook as a six-year-old and I'm, I'm terrified of him in this, in this little cartoon movie. Um, and how many times we listen to the, the language of other people that we don't have control over or society that dictates our initial fears. And so that all was going on in my mind uh, during that initial time. And when I share that story as a, as a keynote speaker and a professional speaker in a breakout session and doing training sessions, I dive deep into what our initial fears actually are before we begin to build a process 
out of that. I guess the, the buzzword for that is reframing. There's a lot of reframing that has to come both from the inside and, and from mm. other people. And I know your wife played a role in that when yes. you were still at the hospital. Absolutely. So when I'm in the lowest moment, you know, when I'm contemplating all these things, I'm, I'm living, living out in um, Wichita, Kansas at the time in the hospital, and I'm wheeled out to an inaccessible playground. And as I'm parked there in the wheelchair, I'm thinking about all these negative thoughts. And she's playing with our son, John Jr. on the swing set. And she sees me struggling because I'm, I just begin breaking down and start crying uncontrollably because my life is totally upside down. It's 180 degrees in a different direction. And she sees that and she comes running over to me and she throws her arms around me. Uh, and she says, what is going on? And I began to articulate, I began to speak to her all my fears. Mm -hmm. And then she says the words that really stopped my downward spiral. She says, you know what, John, we're going to get through this together. You know, this is just our new normal. This is really just our new normal. And when she said those words, she really baselined my entire existence because all these fears I had were really unfounded. They were only my fears, my thoughts of what the future might look like and who had put them in there, who made me think these fears were going to be there. Um, and so as I start, you know, through my sobs and crying, you know, my son, John Jr., he jumps off the swing set. He hits the ground. He comes running over with his little five and a half year old legs and says, hey, dad, you see my big jump? You see my big jump, dad? Dad, you look at my, my jump? And he comes in between myself and Alice, seeing that, you know, I'm struggling. And in that, you know, those 20 uh, meters, he's just validated me as his father. Yeah. And he's created his new normal. And so really they have moved on and before I moved on. Yeah. And sometimes we need those individuals in our life that are so close to our inner circle that they believe for us what we cannot yet see for ourselves. Yeah. And that's critical uh, to have that very small inner circle around us to help us with that initial movement in those redefining moments that we have that we'll, we will have to go through. Mm -hmm.